Welcome to worship. So glad to have you join us this week. Today is our last in our Elvis Presley series. We've had a lot of fun with that. Hopefully you have too. And then next week we actually start a little mini series on the Olympics. So it should be pretty fun. Uh, hopefully you can continue to join us for worship this summer. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for all your blessings. We thank you for filling our lives with your love, with your light, with your grace. Help us to share your love, your light, and your grace with the whole world. We pray this trusting in your mercy and through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah, we sing your praises. All our hearts are filled with gladness. Hallelujah, we sing your praises. All our hearts are filled with gladness. Christ the Lord is who was said. I am one, I am bread. comes from Jeremiah chapter 27. The prophet writes, But if any nation will bow its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let that nation remain in its own land to till it and to live there, declares the Lord. I gave the same message to Zedekiah, king of Judah. 
I said, bow your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, serve him and his people, and you will live. Why will you and your people die by the sword, famine, and plague with which the Lord has threatened any nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Do not listen to the words of the prophets who say to you, you will not serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying lies to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we jump into today's sermon, I want you to take a moment and to listen to our last Elvis song. It is beautiful. It's performed by Cassie Nelson and Angie Lawrence. Uh, you're going to love it. And frankly, there's a really cool story behind it. So I hope you enjoy. be lights burning brighter somewhere got to be birds flying higher in a sky more blue if I can dream of a better land where all my brothers walk hand in hand tell me why oh why peace and understanding sometime strong winds of promise that will blow away all the doubt and fear if I can dream of a warmer sun where hope keeps shining on everyone tell me why oh why His voice. I'm not talking about his vocal cords. I'm not saying that our hero in question came down with a bad case of laryngitis. I mean, there was a point in his life where he didn't have anything to share with the world, which was just fine with the world because frankly, there was a point in life when the world didn't want to hear from our hero. It happens with every great performer, with every great artist, at least the ones who reach the pinnacle. They go grow to such heights that people adore them. And then the time comes where suddenly, as if at once, the world says, ah, we've heard enough. We'd like to hear a different song from a different perspective, from a different voice. That's what happens over and over again throughout human history. There was a point in life where he simply lost his voice. The person I'm talking about, our hero, of course, is Jeremiah. What, were you expecting Elvis? Trust me, we'll, we'll get back to the king of rock and roll shortly. 
The person in question is, is actually Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a poet, preacher, singer, if you will. The problem in ancient Israel is that Jeremiah sang the same song over and over again. Now, he might be one of the most well-known prophets. He has one of the largest books in the Bible named after him. But to say that Jeremiah was famous and beloved would be misleading. He was more notorious and hated rather than famous and beloved. You see, Jeremiah sang, preached, sang the same song over and over again. It was a song of doom and gloom, and it had two stanzas, and they essentially rhymed with one another. The first stanza was about the sin of individuals. Jeremiah was concerned about the, 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 the lack of faithfulness that he saw in the people around him, including family members and friends, neighbors. I mean, the postman, the, the, the baker down the street, Jeremiah went after everyone. He said the problem with God's people is that we have, we have it's, he called it false worship. But what he meant was that they had put God in a box, that they did the, the religious rituals. They did the things that they were, God's people knew they had to do. But they didn't make God first in their life. And as a result of this, nothing worked properly in ancient Israel, according to Jeremiah. See, if you put God first in your life, then the rest of your life is lived through your faith. Jeremiah said, that's not how it is. We put our faith over here and we put the rest of our life over here. Jeremiah went after everyone. Of course, you can imagine people didn't want to hear this. There was a reason why people ignored Jeremiah at first. And then when they couldn't ignore him, there were, there were literally plots against him to silence the prophet once and for all. That was the first verse. As if that weren't doom and gloom enough, the second verse was even worse. Jeremiah had the audacity to say that as God's people, we will be judged. That even though we are God's chosen people, even though God has a special and unique plan for the, our, our community, for the nation of Israel, God can still judge us. Of course, the Hebrew people said, uh-uh. I mean, uh, even the religious leaders sang a far different song, saying, no, we, we are the chosen ones. We are a light to the nations. God's never going to bring judgment upon us. And so people tuned out the song of Jeremiah. They tuned out to the point... When, it was, when they were ready to listen, it was too late. By then, the armies of Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, came into Israel. Not only did they come into Israel, they, they came to Jerusalem and they did the unthinkable. Jerusalem was the city of God. It was, it was fortified by this giant wall. The armies of Babylon rolled over that wall. And then they did something even worse. Not only did they capture the leaders of the Hebrew people, not only did they capture the, the leaders of Jerusalem, but they brought the temple, the house of God, down, brick by brick, stone by stone. And God's people were forced to leave the promised land. The land promised Abraham and Sarah, and they were forced to live somewhere between second-class citizens and slaves in the land of Babylon. And there, for a time, Jeremiah lost his voice, which is probably a good thing. I mean, the J Jeremiah would have been tempted to, to go around saying, I told you so, I told you so, which would not have been helpful to God's people. Jeremiah had nothing to say, and the community of faith, even if Jeremiah did, wasn't ready to listen. The prophet lost his voice, which now brings us to Elvis. Finally, were to the king of rock and roll. Some of you know, uh, in the late 50s, Elvis burst onto the scene uh, through his groundbreaking music. And it really was in, an interesting, really, if you, if you know the history of Elvis, he, one of the things that made him so popular is he, 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 he kind of toyed around, played around in different arenas. He was, he was rock and roll, but he was also blues. He, he was gospel and a little country. He was all these things rolled into one. He came into the, burst onto the American uh, music scene with this, with this dynamic style. And it should be said, he, he danced like people weren't accustomed to seeing. In fact, when I was, I don't know much about Elvis or I didn't until we started this sermon series, I was Lord, maybe it talks about the innocence of the 1950s, but what a national outrage it was, at least in some circles, of how the style that Elvis danced with, the, the gyrating of his hips. I mean, people really thought, this man is leading our kids astray. 
it was a confer very big, big deal. And as a result of that, of course, Elvis got even more press and it probably made him even more popular. But as a result of this, Elvis was in the late 50s and the very early 60s, Elvis was, he was the biggest thing in the world. And then a strange thing happened in the mid-60s. About 1963, Elvis lost his voice. Again, nothing, nothing was wrong with his vocal cords. Elvis stopped singing, or at least he stopped singing before live audiences. The reason for this, the interesting story, is Elvis had a manager who's an awful, awful human being. Elvis's manager decided he could make more money off of Elvis if Elvis just exclusively made movies. Elvis had already dabbled in film. Some people actually thought he was going to be a pretty good actor. He, he genuinely wanted to be a good actor. He wanted to work towards it. That's not what happened. What his, his manager, the Colonel, decided to do was to sign up Elvis for all these movies. These, these movies with a, with a movie studio and the goal was to make movies as quickly and as cheaply as they possibly could. And at some point along the way, Elvis would be his, whatever character he was playing, it didn't matter, they were all going to be the same. He'd be given a guitar, he'd sing a couple songs on the film, they would film it, they would wrap the movie as quickly as possible, and when the movie was going to come out, they would also release the soundtrack to the movie that was tied to Elvis. That way they would be making money from, from both things simultaneously and feed one another. It was the best way for Elvis's manager to make money for himself. And initially, it worked. And then it worked a little less, and by the end it wasn't working at all. And the primary reason for this is because they made these movies, again, as quickly and as cheaply as possible. To the point of, there were times Elvis was singing songs, he had to have the words held up because he didn't know them. He had, he had no opportunity to, to learn them. He wasn't, he wasn't a part of the writing process. The, the actors themselves were oftentimes not given an opportunity to rehearse because that would take time and money. At various, at early on in the process, they decided we're not going to location. Everything was, was shot in the same studio with different backgrounds. So it was akin to like a high school play where you'd have different backgrounds going back and forth, just a couple of different sets. That's how poorly these movies became. And eventually the fans of Elvis grew tired of this. What was once the king of rock and roll, eventually among, of course, he still had his diehard fans, and some of you are included in that, but eventually what happens, a lot of the adults who had liked Elvis said, now nah, we're, we're done with this. They moved on. And the young people, well, the young people were already out on Elvis. I mean, they'd moved on by the late 60s to the, to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Beach Boys and other more popular groups. Elvis lost his voice. My hunch is you can probably, at least at some point in your life, in some ways, relate to Jeremiah and to Elvis. And I fully admit that if 25 years ago when I was going to seminary, one of my seminary professors found out that someday in my pastoral ministry I'd be comparing Elvis to Jeremiah, my diploma would have probably been left unsigned. Okay, so I, I understand this is a bit of a stretch, but I'm guessing that you can sympathize with both of them, at least in this regard, there has probably been a place or a point in your life where you feel like you've lost your voice. Maybe it's in your family. You were once that voice of wisdom. You were the one who people turned to when, when, when life was astray, when life felt amiss, you were that voice of wisdom, that calm, trusted, chorus people could depend upon. And now when you speak, it doesn't give that same emotion. It doesn't give people the same confidence. In fact, maybe, maybe people in your own family don't turn to you any longer, or maybe, maybe you brought a specific tune to your friendship group. You were always the one who would bring something, something interesting, something, something for the whole group to, to, to talk about. People looked for you to the guidance and, and creativity, and, and now, for whatever reason, it feels like they're not listening anymore. Or maybe, maybe it's at work. You used to, when you would sing your song, when you would offer your words, it, it, would, it had power. 
you would you would move the congregation forward. People would turn and listen to you. And now, for whatever reason, it feels like when you when you talk, it's like somebody hit your mute button, and no one's paying attention. You you know what it's like to to lose your voice. Well, if that's that's the case. You should know why this song is so very important, the song that Cassie and Angie just performed for you. It's, it's Elvis's comeback. The funny story behind it is in the late 60s, Elvis, against the advice of his manager, made a deal that he would sing in front of people once more. The, the backstory is this, he made a deal with NBC, they would do a small made-for-TV concert and his manager, once he found out that Elvis was, was not going to say no, that he was going to go through with this, his manager said, okay, I will get all the diehard Elvis fans from around the country. This will be your comeback. This will be great. He got all the tickets. Then the manager didn't give them out to anyone. The, the NBC didn't realize this, nor did Elvis realize this until the day of the recording. And so NBC had to go out throughout the community. In fact, they would go into restaurants, handing out tickets to an Elvis concert. People showed up that night, whether they were fans or Elvis or not, to see something very, very special. Elvis walked on stage and he began to sing. He, did, he didn't sing one of his famous songs at least that wasn't the crowd pleaser. He, he wasn't wearing one of the fancy jumpsuits that he would bring out later in his career, unfortunately. And so he just came out in a normal suit. And he wasn't dancing around. He just, he just sang from his heart this song about dreaming, this song about his future. This, this was Elvis's comeback. He found his voice again. Now, I wish I could tell you it was a happy story. Um, I mean, it started happy. This was the most watched program, not of the week or the month of the year. I mean, think about today. This would, this would be akin, uh, in comparison, this would be akin to the number of people who watch the Super Bowl in the 21st century. That's how many people, relatively to, to today's society, watched Elvis sing this song you just heard. Now, that was quite the comeback. Of course, it ended poorly because Elvis went back to listening to his manager and Let's just think things, things did not end well. But for a moment, at least for a moment, Elvis found his voice, as did Jeremiah. It was probably unthinkable to God's people, but eventually Jeremiah began to sing or to preach again. Only this time, only this time, Jeremiah changed his tune. Jeremiah went around to God's people who were living as second-class citizens and slaves in the land of Babylon. And Jeremiah started telling them that, the, that through the faithfulness of God, there was still hope. That God remembered them. That God had seen the, their plight. That God was going to bring them home. If not them, certainly their children. That they would stand in the land promised to Abraham and Sarah once more. And what is more, God's people listened to this song. It was exactly what they needed to hear. They heard the word of God. It gave them the strength and the desire to continue to move forward. And eventually the day did come. It's like this historical anomaly. One moment, the Babylonian Empire was the greatest empire in the world. And the next day, it was gone. It collapsed, thanks in part to the Persians, thanks in part because it collapsed in on itself. God's people were able to go home. The Hebrew people uh, returned to the land promised to Abraham and Sarah. People of God, your song is important, and you have a song to share. My hunch is today that if you feel like you are voiceless, if you feel like nobody's listening to what you have to say, you have to, you have to make a choice. Maybe you need to, like Elvis, to change your style a little bit. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, but sometimes Christians, sometimes as people of faith, well-intentioned as we may be, we come off a little self-righteous. We might come off as a little judgmental. Sometimes we're a little too intense or a little too right about our things. And we tell people how it is when we really should do a better job of listening and responding. Maybe if people aren't listening to you right now, maybe take this to heart. Maybe it's not what you're saying or what you're singing, but it's the style in which you're singing. Maybe that's the lesson we can learn from Elvis. Or maybe maybe the lesson is we need to change our tune, tune as Jeremiah did. Because people of God, the truth is we meet, I meet 
so many people who are walking through life feeling like they're carrying 500 pound burdens on their shoulder. In a world where people are walking through life feeling like they're just trying to survive the doom and gloom around them, maybe the tune they need to hear most is the song of God's faithfulness. The song of the one who sets captives free and who raises the dead. The song of the God who remembers us in our despair and promises a, us a better and brighter future. People of God, this is our song. As followers of the crucified and risen one, this is our song that we have to share with the world. So may this week, in all that we say and all that we do, may we find our voices and sing that song together for a world that desperately needs it. Amen. Take it away, Jack. <laughs> the common human ties that bind all of your people together. In your light, remind us that you have created all of us in your image, unique and loved by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, breathe new life into all of creation. Send sun to warm and water to saturate yards, fields, and mountains. Set all things in order that abundance may come forth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You feed us at your holy table and send us out to feed others. Bless those who fish, bake, and cook, restaurant servers, grocery store workers, and food shelf volunteers. Open our eyes to your grace present in every meal that we share. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God be in your heart, the grace of God be in your words, the love of God be in your hands, the joy of God be in your soul, and in the song that your life sings. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God.